answering your questions. You are listening to No Other Doctrine. This radio on demand show is pre recorded. Like the Great Wall of China or the Pyramids of Giza, our faith should stand the test of time. To do that, it needs to be built on a firm foundation of solid doctrine. The Apostle Paul urges us in 1 Timothy 4.15 to give our attention to reading, exhortation, and to doctrine. And that's never been more important than it is now. Welcome to No Other Doctrine. This is your opportunity to call in with your questions on doctrine, religion, and reasons for our faith. You can call now at 338-5790 during the next hour. Pastor Scott Tom will answer your questions as we discover why doctrines of the Bible are the only ones that will remain for all eternity. Call with your questions now, 338-5790, and join us for no other doctrine. Good morning and welcome to the live call-in show, No Other Doctrine, with Pastor Scott Tom. This is the show that asks the question, what was the best thing before sliced bread? And here is Pastor Scott Tom. Yay, man. <laughs> what was the best thing before sliced bread? It's always been the Lord. And that's what we talk about on this show is going through Scripture and getting to know our Lord and having a fun time doing that. Just uh, enjoying uh, one another, answering your questions on no other doctrine. Good morning. I'm Pastor Scott Tom, pastor of Cross Christian Fellowship right here in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Born and raised here in Albuquerque, full-fledged. I can eat the chili and the hot sauce, so I can prove it as white as white, but I'm a New Mexican. And we want to look at the doctrine of the Trinity and continue on as we go through that mis most misunderstood doctrine, I think, in Scripture. As you go through it, you uh, gain just uh, an an awesome understanding of the Lord, and, and you're just in awe of Him. And But we also want to take your questions, and you can call in. We do the first part of the show. We, we go through some basic Bible doctrine, and so we try to do something a little different. We could just take Bible questions, but instead of doing that, I like going through, and you actually are getting a collegiate-level systematic theology class. Because I taught systematic theology for, oh, geez, about 16 years, California, and uh, under the tutelage of Pastor Raul Reese there in uh, Calvary Chapel, Golden Springs, and had the just the pleasure of doing that and raising up pastors as we had a pastoral school, a regular Bible college, and just something I love, just taking the Word of God and just dumping it into people and allow the Lord to use them in just mighty ways. And so that's what we're doing on the air. God's allowed this class to go on the air, basically, and then to answer your questions so that you might be built up in your faith, that you might have reasons to believe, and that you might be steadfast. There's so many times that Paul goes through the Word and tells us to be steadfast when you look up that Word or any other uh, synonym of that Word. Uh, you'll find out that it's used over and over and over in Scripture to be steadfast. That's to know what you believe and to stand in it, not to be moved. And as we named the show, No Other Doctrine, because uh, basically Paul exhorted Timothy that when he was at Ephesus, that he would make sure that they teach no other doctrine. And so it's important that we know the truth because the truth will set you free. And so as we go through this, we want to look at the Trinity and take a different skew on this, because a lot of times we just go through and we show, well, we see that the Father is God. We see that Jesus is God. We see that the Holy Spirit is God and the three are one. I I want to go through and see where there's distinct characteristics of God that only God possesses. And then we're going to see how each person of the Trinity possesses that. And if God is saying, I'm the only one who has this ability, capability, then that's the logical conclusion that the three are one. And we talked about last week that God, from the beginning, in the first chapter of Genesis, used compound plurality when describing himself, Elohim, 
which means more than one but in one unity. And so from the very beginning, including let us make man in our image, that we had the, the groundwork, the, the precedent set for the Holy Spirit. And we'll go on and we'll, we'll deal with these areas and we'll kind of talk about how that's not illogical. And then we'll also talk about what it's not. Because sometimes the best way to understand something is to make those distinctions. In other words, define what it isn't and it clarifies what it truly is. And so we'll finish up with that. And then we'll go in next week and we'll begin with anthropology. Maybe not next week. I don't know if we'll, depending on the phone calls today, if we'll get through this all today. Anthropology, so we'll go into the creation of man, how God created us, why he created us. And uh, we'll deal with things like the soul. Where does the soul come from? Do you know how to answer that question? Is there a soul? Can you prove there's a soul? And what that makes us unique and also proves a very sound argument against evolutionism. So let's get into the Trinity here and kind of back up, give you an understanding of the direction we're going. We covered that there's one God seen in three persons who are each fully God. And God himself is separated and says that there, in Isaiah 44, 8, that is there any God besides me? No, there is none. There's no other rock. I don't know of anyone. I do not know of one. God definitely saying there is one God, only one God, only one. And therefore, we looked and saw in John 8:54 that the Father is called God. We see in John 1, 1 that Jesus, um, who is the Word made flesh, is called God. We also see in John 20 where Thomas confesses that uh, Jesus is not only Lord, but God. We see in Acts 5 that Ananias and Sapphira not only lied to God, but they lied to the Holy Spirit, equating the Holy Spirit with God. And then we looked and saw that there's only one creator, Isaiah 44, 24. God says, I am the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, all capital, which means what? That's his covenant name. That's the name that's the unspeakable name which we only have the four letters, Y-H-W-H. And so there is no Yahweh or is no Jehovah in the Bible, technically. We take those and we transliterate, we throw in vowels and we come up with those names. But technically, we don't know exactly how that would be pronounced. And uh, But we do have a name that was given to us, that no other name under heaven and earth that people can be saved by, but... Jesus Christ. But in Isaiah 44, 24, God says, I alone created, I alone stretched out the heavens and made the earth myself. And we see that in Genesis 1, 1, talking about God in general, the Father. We see Jesus being the, the creator in John 1, 3 and Colossians 1, 16. Colossians 1, 16 says that by him all things were created, things in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, thrones, powers, principalities, so just so you, in case you didn't understand what he was saying, in all things, he starts naming everything. Everything in heaven, everything on earth, everything under the earth, the things you can see, things you can't see. So he, he gets very specific. In John 1, 3, he narrows it down even more. He says, all things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. See, the scripture puts things in, in so many different ways that it defines itself and it narrows it down to very concrete, clear answers. So some people will say, well, Jesus created some things, you know, or he was created and then God created through him. But that's not the case because it says here in John 1, 3, that everything that is created, Jesus did it. Nothing was created except by him. So you can't create yourself. If you don't exist, you can't create yourself. So he had to be everlasting. He has to be eternal. He has to be almighty, all-powerful, the one who is the creator. But we also saw that the Holy Spirit was creator. In Psalm uh, 104.30, it talks about the Holy Spirit. You sent your spirit and they were created. In Job 33.4, the Spirit has made me and given me breath. He's called the Almighty so what does that lead us to as we go through this? What, what we see is, again, there's only one 
who is called God, I know no other, God says. But then Jesus is called God. The Holy Spirit is called God. The Father is called God. The three must be one. Uh, you see that there's only one who is who created. I alone created, God said. Well, then, but we see that it's ascribed to the Father as he created. We see that the Son created. We see that the Holy Spirit created. The three must be one. We talked about, and we got a call last week that we're talking a little bit about the Holy Spirit. And we made the distinction at the end of the show that they are the same essence, but not the same person. And sometimes people get confused on that. They think that God is in heaven, then God became Jesus, and God then became the Holy Spirit. It's one taking three kind of acts, you know, like an actor playing different parts. That's not the case. It's one God who who has the same essence throughout. The Father has the same essence as Jesus. They're all God. The Holy Spirit is God. They all have all the attributes and essence characteristics of God. They lack nothing. Yet, they're distinct persons. And we know that because the Father sent Jesus. Jesus sent the Holy Spirit. So, it's not a name for the, the same persons. They're different people because one is staying and the other is leaving. You know, and so they're, one is coming away from the other or, or they can be together at the same time but, but doing different functions. And so they're distinct personalities. How does that work? Well, we'll get into that a little bit. We don't, we're, we're limited in what we do know, but, uh, we'll, we'll kind of talk about that. Let's look at the resurrection power. There's only one sovereign God who has power over life and death. We see in Deuteronomy 32, 39, it says, see now that I, even I, am he, and there is no God with me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. Neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. So Deuteronomy 32, 39 says basically that God, not only is he creator, but he has power over life and death. And there's no one with him. There's no God with me. There's no other one than him. All others have the title little g gods, like they uh, have power over men's lives in the sense of like the judges of Israel that we see, that they were called gods by God, in the, only in the sense that they they can have somebody put to death. Not that they have the power over life and death, but they, but they in a sense they do because they can make a judgment and say, well, we're going to have you executed. And so in the sense they're playing, and I'm, you can see my fingers, I'm doing the quote signs. They're playing God. And so God gives them the the that title. And here we see that God says he is alone as the one who gives life, takes life, gives life that wounds or heals in the sense of bringing somebody back from the dead. And yet in Acts 2, 22 through 24, Peter is preaching and he says that God the Father uh, raised Jesus. He says, ye men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God, among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it is not possible that he should be held by it. So here it says God raised him up. Jesus was slain by these people. God raised him up. But yet, when we look at Scripture, we see in John chapter 2, verses 19 through 21, Jesus himself said, I raise myself up. Jesus answered them, said, Destroy this temple, and and I will raise it in three days. And the Jews replied, It's taken 46 years to build this temple, and you're going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. So Jesus is claiming that he himself will raise himself up. From the dead. Only God can do that. God says, I'm the only one that has that power. The Holy Spirit is given that attribute, though. In Romans 8:11, it says, But if the Spirit of him who raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwells in you. So God says, The Spirit raised Jesus from the dead, and if 
if this, if uh, he raised Jesus from the dead, that same spirit that dwells in you, it's assurance that God will surely raise you, you from the dead, and he'll do that by his spirit. So here the spirit has the same distinction when God says, I alone have that ability. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit each are seen in Scripture as having that ability. The three are one. See, God is narrowing it down and saying there's only one that has this. Those three personages of the Trinity each have that ability. That's where we get the Trinity from. It doesn't come from some weird Greek philosophy or from Plato or from any of these other areas. There are books that trace it back and and prove that, that that's not even a true understanding of these other cultures that people say Christianity borrowed it from these areas. They didn't. It was revealed to them through Scripture. You can see it alluded to in the Old Testament and clearly shown in the New Testament. And there's just no way around it. So Christian theologians from the very beginning understood, and last week we read a quote from the early church history when they're in the the Roman catacomb, uh, catacombs, very early on, they're, they're scratching this in the wall. This kind of like early Christian graffiti. They're putting it in the wall because that was one of the meeting places for their church. And they confess the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as Holy Trinity. And so this doctrine was from the very beginning. And it's in Scripture, and it, it points to that. Because we have an awesome God who will surely guide us in this. So that is... As we go through this, this is what's describing as the the Trinity. And so it's easily understood and brought out through the Word of God. And now, it's not easy to understand, but I want to assure you that it, it this is what has been since the beginning of the Word. And then you see how it's worked in Scripture. Because if Jesus truly has that ability, all power and authority is given to him, he has the ability to raise himself from the dead. Only God has that ability. We go, th- we went through and we proved beyond a shadow of a doubt, Jesus is God. Beyond a shadow of a doubt, the Holy Spirit is God. They all have the same attributes, the very same essence. The only way to deal with that is to understand, as God himself has revealed, that there's a trinity. And see, we can't go make something up. We have to stick to scripture. And scripture teaches us that. The three are one. And God, using the very terms for this, starting in the very beginning, compound unity, Elohim, it's a plural unity for God. He could have just said El, which means God. But Elohim is compound unity. More than one, but they're tied together as one, like a grape cluster. So that's a good place to take a break because we got the commercials Coming up, we do have an email question that I wanted to get to last week. We didn't have time, so we'll get to that after this break. So we'll be right back. Do you want a deep walk with God and be used by Him? Do you want to learn from the best professors, pastors, and thought leaders in Christianity today? You can do this at a low cost and at your own pace at ccfcollege.com. It is a completely different type of school. The tests are about growing in character, not grades. We will add to your knowledge, but we really want to transform your life. Similar programs will cost you $18,000. However, the first 200 students in our program will get in for only $47 a month. After that, the price will go up. For information, text CCF College to 33444. That's CCF College to 33444. Or go to ccfcollege.com. That's ccfcollege.com. Hey, boo boo. Welcome back to No Other Doctrine. Oh, Yogi. Hey, welcome back into No Other Doctrine. We're a little bit silly, a little bit slappy this morning because I woke up early and, you know, I guess when you get old, you start waking up and you can't go back to sleep or whatever it is. So, but. You know, such is life. We've, we're, we're given a great Savior, and I'm not complaining. We, we're having a, a good time going through Scripture here. And we got an email that came in, and I've been wanting to get to this for a couple weeks here and answer uh, a question sent in by uh, Trish. And uh, you can email us your questions. 
you can go to nootherdoctrine.org. That's our sister website. Our main website is crossfellowship.org. But you can go over to nootherdoctrine.org and uh, go to the contact page, and from there you can email us a question. And uh, we'll, uh, unless you specify otherwise, we're, we're always going to try to answer it on air. It may take us a week or two to get to it, depending on how many calls we got coming in. But we will get to it. And also, if you want some of this information that I'm giving out about the Trinity, a lot of this is in a paper that I put up on the website in the articles section. You can scroll down to the doctrine area and it'll talk, it'll say Trinity. It's a PDF file that you can download and actually print and hand out at the door. Somebody comes knocking at your door and uh, they don't uh, quite understand the the Trinity or they're misrepresenting the Trinity and they want to give you uh, some magazine or something, say, sure, I'll take that as long as you take this. And if they deny taking it, well, we can't take that. Well, you can talk to them and says, well, you know, that's one of the definitions of being brainwashed is that you can't see other people's material. And it'll get them mad, but it'll it'll shake them up because it is. If uh, you're only allowed to see one view of something, that's brainwashing. And uh, say, hey, this is something that, you know, that I just printed up on my computer. It's not like from some official, you know, anti-something website. And uh, have them have them take it. So let's get back to this email. We got uh, Trisha emailed us in. And um, she said that she missed an episode. Aw. How, how can that happen? Anyways. She missed an episode and she says, can you tell me, she says, uh, about this, uh, I didn't know if the spirit of discernment was discussed. Can you tell me about that? Are people with this gift able to hear or see things in the spirit world? What about when you have that gut feeling or intuition that you just know something is not right? Is that discernment? Well, that's a good question because uh, really that does come up. When sometimes, oftentimes it's mistaught the gift of uh, discernment. And people will say, well, it's the ability to see auras around people, you know, like, like the 60s man, you know. And so, like, I came into the church and I was, like, tripping. And I saw the, you know, like the green mist around you. And because God's given me the, the spirit of discernment. Well, that's not what the gift is is about it's not that you see into the spirit world that you see spirits and you see things like that there's no ministry of deliverance in scripture their people are delivered but there's not a person who's given that ministry like a demon hunter we get all caught up in those type of things i have a deliverance ministry well may god may use you to deliver some people but that's not a specific ministry because we're not to glorify the enemy nor go looking for the enemy we're to save people we're to go after lost sheep and to save them. And uh, occasionally when we do that, we we end up uh, encountering the enemy, encountering wolves. And uh, so sometimes there's a standoff, but that's not the purpose that we're called to. When you look at the gift of here, the ability to discern spirits, Scripture defines Scripture. So that's how we know that it's there and it's, it's the enabling to distinguish between human and satanic spirits, but you're not seeing into the spirit world. You just know that there's a there's a spirit present or there's a spirit acting through a person. So, uh, for example, we used Acts 16 where there was a fortune teller who was following Paul and was crying out, these men are servants of the God Most High and they pro- proclaim the way of salvation and you remember Paul, this went on for days, and Paul was grieved in the spirit, and he turned to her and says, you know, and cast out the spirit, and she, he, the spirit came out that very hour. Well, a lot of people wouldn't understand that. They wouldn't notice that that's actually spirit, because that's something that you would, if you were going into a new town, and you were going to be preaching the gospel, and somebody who comes along and says, hey, listen to these, uh, somebody from the town saying, listen to these people, they're, they're, they're preaching the word of God. You wouldn't necessarily think that that was a bad thing. But he had discernment that this was false advertising, bad advertising from uh, the satanic realm. Secondly, it's the enabling to distinguish between right and wrong motives. And so, yes, Trish, it is sometimes that gut feeling. That's how, 
it, even though it's a supernatural gift, it comes off sometimes very natural, uh, seemingly natural. And so it's that intuition, that gut feeling that, wow, this, I don't believe this person. I don't believe their motives. Kind of get a glimpse and see into their heart. We can't physically do that. God can. He can see all what's going on in everybody's heart. Then he gives it through his Holy Spirit. He gives us kind of a glimpse into that. And so you see in Acts chapter 8 where Simon, who was a sorcerer, saw the disciples laying hands on people. And he goes, well, give me that power too. I'll give you money if you'll allow me to have that that power too. And, you, you know, if you didn't know his motive, you could be like, oh, bless his heart. You know, he just... He's doing it all wrong. He wants to give, you know, money for that. But isn't his heart just great? Bless his heart because he just wants to help people and, and lay hands and have the Holy Spirit given out. Well, that's not the reason. And Peter understood this. And so Peter knew that he was bound up and poisoned by bitterness and envy and impurity because he had been the top dog in this city. And he wanted to get back on people looking to him. And he wanted to have this as something that people came to him and that, Probably there he was going to want them to pay him, and he and he was bitter against the apostles, kind of taking his spot as the spiritual leader in the community, and so that's what will happen here. So oftentimes people have this gift, pastors will have this gift, uh, people who are in the mission field and ha- or have to be in administration and deal with a lot of individuals, they'll have this gift uh, when they have to do business on a regular basis. And so some people in the business world be given this. A lot of ladies have this gift. And so they can they can kind of get that. But here's something. With this gift, you always need to check your heart because sometimes you just have something against a person and you're thinking something's wrong with them because you want something to be wrong with them or their motive when actually it's just because our own hearts are bitter. So you always got to make sure that if you're getting a gut feeling about a person that it isn't something that that you're projecting on them because you had a bad experience with them before or somebody gave you advice or something ahead of time that gave you a, a preconception or a misconception about this person. And so you're thinking, oh, they're terrible when they're actually pretty nice. And so you you take things wrong that they say. And so sometimes you can read into it and you got to be careful on that. So that answers that question, but she had a two-part question here. And the second half is, I think, more important. She goes, how come pastors don't talk much about being single? And when they do, they talk about it being good because you don't have any ties that you can give all your time to the Lord. And she says, I understand part of it. She goes, what about a single mother or single father? Giving your time is not as easy when you have children to take care of. Also, pastors never talk about how hard it is being single, especially if you are a Christian, and when the loneliness kicks in and when we're we're supposed to overcome that. I don't know if they don't talk about it because they have been married for so long and don't remember or they just don't talk about it. And so she says, I've never heard a, a series on singleness. And she goes on and discusses some other things, which is a good point. So to answer some of those questions, Trish, the why do pastors, they don't talk about singleness as much? And being a pastor, and I, not only do I play one on TV, I am an actual pastor. The And I've done a counseling for, gosh, close to 18, 20 years now. The reason that pastors talk more about the problems in marriage and counseling on marriage and and have more studies on that is because, and pastors will back me up on this, 80% of all your counseling is with marital relationships. 80% of of my counseling will be on marriage. How do I I, uh, get along with my spouse? We're having difficulties. We're having financial difficulties. We're having spiritual difficulties. We're having difficulties... Because anything that that person gets into or struggles with is going to affect the marriage. So your spouse, if they're struggling with anger, it's going to affect the marriage. It's not a single, singular spiritual problem. It affects the whole family. If that person's struggling with gambling or alcohol or drugs, with uh, lust, lying, all those things are going to affect the marriage. When you're single, 
that really only affects you, and so you don't necessarily come in for counseling for that. Some people do, but it's it's very remote. And so the vast majority of, of issues that pastors are dealing with on a counseling, on a regular basis on counseling, is marriage counseling. And so they're seeing, you know, I need to say something from the pulpit more and try to, because I only have limited time to do this one-on-one. If I can give more studies from the uh, pulpit, then I'll be able to counsel on a broad basis, kind of like. So, yeah, it does kind of neglect the singles. And singles go through some of the same struggles because we're all human. We have the same struggles, same problems. And it, and it seems twice as bad when you're single because, gosh, I don't have my spouse that I could pour my heart out to and somebody who could just put their arm around me or somebody who would just listen to me. You know, and I, I miss that reassuring touch and that encouragement and those other things. So it seems twice as hard on the single person, especially if they're a single parent, because they're doing multiple jobs, sometimes holding down two jobs or they're juggling things because and then they feel guilty on top of that because somebody's watching their kid and raising their kid, they feel. So I know, Trisha, it could be extremely hard. And I think you have a great attitude. You go on, you say, I understand that the Lord is my husband. And he truly is. And Isaiah, he talks about that. The Lord is your husband and your provider. And he's the father to the fatherless. And so, yeah, you have to rest in those times. But you are going to struggle with those areas of, boy, I wish there was someone there for me. Just as sometimes in a marriage that they're going to struggle with that relationship. Boy, you know, our relationship's strained. And I, I feel bad because we're not talking to one another. And so they have a, a whole other set of problems. So in each place, before we're married, you know, we're like, ah, oh, I can't wait to get married, you know. And so we're praying, Lord, bring me the right girl, you know. And so every time we go into the into the sanctuary or any kind of Christian thing, and and some girl looks at you because you're you're trying to you bump into her or or you're trying to step over to get into the seat, you know. And she looks up and, oh Lord, is she the one? Oh my gosh, she's pretty. You know, I think look, she's at church. She's godly. And so immediately, you know, and then somebody, oh, the girl who's singing, she's looking right at me, you know. Oh, God, I wish I had that that person. She's the right one. Is she the one? And so we're constantly be absorbed with that. Then we, we get married or, or or we go through a divorce. And so now we're, we're single or we have a single life after we had a relationship. And we're kind of back in, into the same area. And it's the the key is waiting on the Lord. In, in everything, waiting on the Lord and trusting Him. And it's really a step of faith. It, it, it enhances your walk. And why does God allow us to go through that when obviously He could bring someone to us? You know, He could satisfy our every single need, every moment of every day. But He doesn't do this because there are times where He just going through those things are going to develop character in us. And we think, ah, oh, how's that going to develop character in me? Well, one, patience. Two, Trust and faith, because you, you, if you trust that God is all knowing, He's present everywhere, and He's all powerful, what does that do for you? Well, if He's all knowing, then He knows the right person for you. If He's if He's present everywhere, He's with that person, and He can direct them to you. And if He's all powerful, then He can bring you guys together. He can work circumstances to bring you together. And guess what? He's also omnibenevolent, which means He's all loving. And that means that he's going to do it at the right person, the right time, in the right place. But when you're praying for that person, I wish I had this person to comfort. Oftentimes that person's praying for the same thing too. But what God is more concerned about is our character and not our comfort. Because if you don't have the right character bringing you together in that relationship, you end up in that 80% group who just have a problem with going with relationships. And so you have to have the right character to have the best of all relationships. And so I know it's painful and I know it gets lonely, but the idea is allow God to work in these circumstances so that you become a princess of God and God will bring you that prince. And in doing so, that's that's such a, a, a blessing. And so you lay out that hope before you that God cares about you and he will work these things out because he he doesn't withhold good gifts from his kids, but there's a process and oftentimes receiving those gifts. And the main thing is draw close to God 
and he'll give you the desires of his heart. He truly will. So hopefully that helps, Trish. I thank you for writing in and that that will encourage you and help you in your walk. Let me pray for you real quick and we're about right on a break here. So Father, we just thank you for Trish. We pray that you would just comfort her heart, that you would encourage her. She would give her the ability as a single parent or whatever her circumstance is, Father, to just endure, to grow in character and that you would lead her to that right person and that right person to her at the proper time, Father, to have a wonderful relationship in you and that it would be blessed and be one, Father, that would be exactly as she desires, Father, according to your promises and your will. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well, we're right up against a break, and we'll take your calls after this break, and so we'll be back in a flash. Hi, this is Pastor Scott Tom. If you enjoy No Other Doctrine, you might also enjoy reading my book, Discipleship on Fire, a step-by-step process to discipling anyone. It is a useful resource for any parent, teacher, coach, and especially anyone in ministry. You can order it at crossfellowship.org or at amazon.com. Just search for Discipleship on Fire by Scott Tom. Yes, yes. Welcome back into the middle of Dr. Neonel. Yes. Seemingly going through scripture at a snail's pace. We are, you know, it's hard just to run through this because um, it's really important to get in, to get to know these doctrines and to understand them properly, so that your walk with God becomes powerful and steadfast. And so, when you, the more you know about Him, the more you're able and capable to do in uh, Christ, and you can walk with Him, and you can walk with Him with the surety and power and confidence, and there's just there's nothing like it. I mean, I I just walk out and after going through this so many times and going through the arguments for, for God and you go through that, there's just doubt can't creep in. And and it's not that that uh, I'm not open to everything else. I've, I've, I own just about every major work in religion and have read through a good portion of of most of these other areas of taught cults and comparative religions. And they just don't hold a candle to Christianity, to the Word of God at all. The Word of God proves that it truly is God's revelation to us and, and because of things like prophecy. I mean, you just cannot deny that hundreds of years before that God tells us exactly what's going to happen to the very day, the very hour, the very person, you know, when Christ would be born and and under what circumstances and his death and betrayed by a friend and be betrayed for for 30 pieces of silver and to be buried in a rich man's tomb, be crucified, to be whipped, to be crucified between two thieves. And it just goes on and on. And that's just the prophecies, simple prophecies about Christ. There's 326 prophecies about his life, death and resurrection, his first coming to earth. And you, that's just not by coincidence. And you cannot purposely fulfill those on your own, like where you're born and, and you know, who's going to betray you and to raise, raise yourself from the dead. And it just isn't, can't happen. Now nope. it's, it's gotta be God, you know? And so that's just one, one argument for this whole thing. The other thing is, is as we're going through this and we're looking at the Trinity is that, if if I was writing scripture, you know, and I was trying to come up with a religion and I was trying I wouldn't I wouldn't come up with the Trinity because it's very difficult to put down in words and it would be so easy to mess up this doctrine. But you see through throughout all of scripture, this doctrine is consistent and it fits in there perfectly. You could, you could mess up the essence of one person or have one person below another person in character and in essence and not make them the same. You could mess up names. You could mess up the identities. Uh, it would just be so easy to get this doctrine wrong. It's a very, it's a complicated doctrine in some ways. It's a very simple doctrine in other ways. But if you were writing out all of scripture, see, it's not just one person doing this. 
you've got the Bible written out over a period of 1,500 years in three different continents and three different languages by over 40 different authors. They're covering hundreds of controversial topics, yet they're 100% accurate in all these areas, the major areas being historically, morally, prophetically, and theologically, 100% accurate. It doesn't need revision. All these other works, they don't even come close in describing these things. And even if they do get into doctrine, they're revised over and over and over again. You know, the Mormon doctrines, they've been revised. The the Jehovah's Witness doctrines, they've been revised. There's major revisions in there. And so you look at this and you're just blown away. We see in the Trinity that there is one who's omnipotent. And he is the God Almighty. In Psalm 135, 5, he says, I know that the Lord is great, that our God is greater than all gods, that the Lord is great. He's the Almighty One. Job 42, 2 says, I know that you can do all things. No plan of yours can be thwarted. And in Exodus 6, 3, it says, God here talking says, I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, but By my name, Lord, I was known to them. And so when you look at this, you see there's one God. He's all-powerful. There's the only one that is all-powerful. And as we look at that, we see Jesus has the same name ascribed to him. He's the Almighty One. In Revelation 1.8, he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty well, who is the Almighty? He's the Alpha and the Omega. If you look at Revelation 1, 17 and 18, we see another one who's first and the last. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the Almighty. He says, And when I saw him, I fell as at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega. Who is who? The Almighty. I am he who lives. And was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and death. So we see here, that's Jesus. Because when was Jehovah God ever dead? Jesus was the only one who was dead, and he was raised again. Revelation 22 talks about it in the same way. It says, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. There's no other but Jesus. He's the Almighty, the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. There's only, we see that God is the Almighty, the first and the last. You see the Holy Spirit. In Zechariah 4, 6, that the word of the Lord came to Zerubbabel, not by mount, might, nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord Almighty. So the Spirit is Almighty. And so you see all three being the all-powerful one. Well, There can only be one all-powerful one. Therefore, the three are one. So as you go through this, you you see time and time again where the three are one. Now, we we have callers calling in, but you dropped off. I'll take your calls if you call back in. We have a little bit of time left. Sometimes I know that you get on there or you're on your cell phone, it drops off. Go ahead and call back in, and I will get to those calls. Let's look at the next characteristic here. Omnipresent means being everywhere at once, and we see... In 1 Kings 8.27 says, But will God really dwell on earth? The heavens, even the highest heavens, cannot contain you. How much less this temple I have built. So we see here that Solomon has built this temple that it cannot contain God. He's He transcends that. There's nothing that really contains God. He's everywhere. Isaiah 66.1 says that this is what the Lord says, Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house you will build for me? And where is my where will my resting place be? In other words, there's no place that can contain me. We see Jesus is the same thing. He says that where there are two or three witnesses in my name, I'm there with them. That's in Matthew 18 and John 14. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me and keeps my word, my father will love him and we will come and make our home with him. Well, that could be anywhere in the world, multiple people. So he'd have to be in more places at the same time. He'd have to be omnipresent. We see the Spirit, the same thing. Um, the Holy Spirit, the best scripture on this, there's several, but the best scripture I think is Psalm 139, verses 7 through 9. It says, 
Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, you are there. So we can't run away from God's spirit. He's everywhere. He's omnipresent. Again, that's only a characteristic that God has. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit each have that characteristic. The three must be one. Because we've shown that the, each person of the Trinity is distinct. So therefore, the three must be one in, in the same manner as compound unity. Compound unity. And as we go through, you can do this with omniscience, that God is all-knowing. You can show that Jesus was, he knew the hearts of men, he knew everything, that the Holy Spirit was omniscient, he knows the hearts of men as well, he knows the heart of God, the, the things of God. No one knows that except the Spirit of God in 1 Corinthians 2. Therefore, the Father knows all things, therefore, Jesus knows all things, the Holy Spirit knows all things, but it says that There's only one who knows all things. There's only one who's all-knowing, and that is God. So as we see this, we see that God is three persons and yet remains one. Compound unity. People say this is illogical. It's a contradiction. That is not correct. It is not illogical. It may be hard to understand. Okay? And understand, we're limited. We are limited in three, three and a half Four dimensions. Some people argue, you know, different ones. At max, we're in four dimensions. Well, through mathematics and other physics, they've proven that there's at least ten more dimensions. And because of that, those dimensions are going to have characteristics far beyond our own that we are not going to understand. But once we transcend this body, we can experience those dimensions in our, in our new life in a resurrected body. And we'll be able to do things beyond that. Let me give you a quick example, and and this comes from somebody who comes to our church, Steve. And so as we were talking over lunch one time, he he says, we were talking about string theory and and dimensions. And he says, now, if we were, think if you're like an ant, if your ant was two-dimensional, like they were flat like a piece of paper. You know, it's kind of hard to conceive of in in our mindset, but their their life is is a table, and And they walk flat, so they can't look up, they can't look down. And suddenly you put your finger before them. What what is that going to appear like? It's going to appear like a giant oval uh, appeared right before them, right? So they can't look up, they don't see the hand, they can't look down, they don't see where the finger ends. They just see like a slice of your finger. So they just suddenly see this oval appear in front of them. But if you pick that up and then put it behind them, it's going to look like that oval disappeared and was suddenly transported behind him, right? Then all they did is pick up their finger and put it down behind you. But it's going to look like Star Trek, like it was transported up and transported right behind you. And and so it's going to look strange. And it'll be hard to explain, yet from our viewpoint, we were like, I just picked up my finger from one end and put it to the other. But if you're a two-dimensional being, it would seem like, wow, man, he just dematerialized and rematerialized over there like you were raptured, like they were transported. Well, see, there's when you have that understanding, then you have the understanding of other dimensions that God is far beyond us. So God is three persons is not a contradict, contradiction. It's not irrational. Here, this would be a contradiction. God is three persons and God is not three persons at the same time. That's a contradiction. Okay, that's an actual illogical argument. Uh, but because something is, isn't something you can understand doesn't make it illogical or something that you reject. I don't understand string theory. I don't know if it's, it's absolutely true or not. I know that some parts of physics, quantum physics and, and nuclear fusion, I couldn't describe that to you, but I, I believe it. I don't understand how DSL travels outside of the line and electricity travels through the line. I don't understand how I, but I believe it because I can make a phone call while I'm online. Now, how does that work? Should I say, I'll, I'm going to cut this line because I don't believe it. I'm not going to go online. No, we, we understand that. So as we see this, we see that God is 
Trinity and that it's not a contradiction. I think next week we'll, we'll talk about how you can reason that God is Trinity and also uh, what is not the Trinity. And that will wrap up the Trinity. We'll go through false views and that will give us plenty of instruction on, on the Trinity. We won't have a perfect understanding of it, but we'll have enough understanding that you can't deny it. It's in Scripture. Secondly, uh, God is very capable of doing that. And thirdly, then we'll understand what it isn't so that we can identify those things and also clarify in our minds what we truly believe. Uh, so we'll go over that, and then the following week we'll get into uh, the other doctrines. We want to thank you to listen, listening to No Other Doctrine. You can go to our website, noothardoctrine.org, and, uh, or crossfellowship.org and find out more about us and when we meet. Or if you want to come out and say hi or email us a question through the week, uh, we'd love to have you do that. So we'll see you next week. So blessed wishes to you. Thanks for joining us for No Other Doctrine. To learn more about Pastor Scott Tom and his ministry at Cross Christian Fellowship, be sure to visit our website at crossfellowship.org. We hope you'll join us again next time as we continue to explore why the doctrine of God is the only doctrine that can bring eternal life. You've been listening to No Other Doctrine with Pastor Scott Tom. For more information, visit crossfellowship.org.